Bobby D. Hamilton. I welcome you once again back here to Pastor B's Kitchen Table. For those that have been following us all these previous weeks, you know that it's called the Kitchen Table because this is a place where we chop it up, break it down, and put it back together again. It is an environment that is very raw, it's very real, and it deals with relationships. So I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that, that you took my advice to, to come back and join us again on this Friday. We've been talking about a whole litany of things over the previous week. We've talked about trust. We've talked about communication. We've talked about love. We spent three weeks talking about dating and how do we date, how should we date, and you heard different perspectives. I had some guests here with me also, but today, today, today I want to go down a road that many of us have traveled, many people have talked about, many of you have traveled, or you know someone that is traveling there right now. It's a very difficult road, so I'm going to spend a few weeks dealing with this. I'm going to be talking about the issue related to how do we affair proof our marriages. I want to talk about marriage, but not just from simply the the wedding and the blissfulness of it, and the and the great the great you know, the great honeymoon. And all that. I want to talk about what happens when the vow breaks. What happens when you find out in today's vernacular that 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 he or she has a side piece? Uh, how do you navigate those waters? Uh, some of you are married today, and and you got married, and you meant until death do us part, and you're doing a great job, and I commend you for that. But there's others. And you know what it's like to have your trust violated, uh, to be left high and dry, to find out that he or she loves you, but not only you. And, and you've gone through those waters, and, and you know, just even hearing me say this, just the emotions of this, because you're living there now, how, how it affects you financially, and how it affects you spiritually, and how it affects you socially, how your social circles have been disturbed, interrupted, and how it affects you parentally, dealing with parents. Now you got to have visitations and pickup times, and trying to figure out what to do with the kids. What do you tell them? What do you not tell them? And, and all that whole, just a sudden of things under that umbrella whenever the, the vow gets broken. And, and I want to just talk about that for, for a series of weeks, about what can we do, what should we do as it relates to the idea of affair-proofing our marriages and, and, and how to deal with that. Um, one of the greatest stories of this in the Bible, one of the most heroic, memorable stories for people inside the church and outside the church, they always remember the story of David in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And that's that's the passage, chapter 11, it's like chapter 11 bankruptcy. That's the point in which David kind of goes spiritually bankrupt. The story is told that David, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, that at the time when kings go out to battle, uh, David just kind of had a little R and R. He doesn't go out to battle. And there's King David, he's walking on the roof of, of his great palace. And he happens to see in his peripheral, he happens to see this beautiful woman bathing. At that point in time, David had a choice to make, and David decided to continue looking, and not just looking because that was not enough. She's a beautiful woman. He decided to send people to inquire about her and to go get her. And in verse 4, here's the operative verse. In verse 4 of the Bible says, David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. He lay with her. Um, he took her. Now, she was the wife of Uriah, another man. Not only that, she was the wife of a man who was part of David's inner circle, David's mighty men, David's personal warriors, if you will, his, his SEAL Team 6, if you want to call them that. So he had affiliations, he had relationships with Uriah. But yet to see Bathsheba and all of her naked glory, uh, he chose that particular time uh, to not just gaze at her, not just to inquire about her, but to take her and to lie with her. And the story goes all the way on. She comes back and reports to David that that, that, that one-night affair was not a one-night affair uh, because she became pregnant. But I want to ask you the question that how are you dealing with that? How are you dealing with, with the realization that your spouse uh, is with someone else or has been with someone else. What are you doing? It's, it's, it's often said, in fact, a pastor friend of mine tells a story that 
for there to be a good relationship, there, he called them five T's. For a good relationship to exist, you must have time. You must be able to spend time together, enjoying one another, getting to know one another. Also, there must be a time of communication. You got to talk. You got to talk. You got to open your mouth, and you got to be able to articulate who you are, what your desires are, what your hopes and aspirations are. But just just to talk. Also, there must be transparency when you talk. You must be able to kind of tell about genuinely to really come behind the veil of your own fears and communicate explicitly about who you are, what you desire, what you like, what you don't like, but transparency is a must. Also, there must be trust. There must be trust. You gotta be able to trust the person that you that you're dealing with. You have an authentic relationship. There must be trust. If you don't have trust, you can't really have a real authentic relationship. And the last thing that must be touching. There must be the caressing. There must be the actual the actual physicality of the relationship. He said those are requirements to have a real good relationship. However, those can also be exploited. Those can also be spun. Those can also be misdirected towards someone who's not your spouse. You can spend time with someone who's not your spouse. It's a job. You're always there. And, and, and when you go to work, you know, you, you always, most of the time you dress nice and you're, you're smelling nice and you, you show up, you just got out to shower or something. So you're at your best. You kind of had your morning cup of joe and you're excited, ready to start the day. And you're together and sometimes close quarters for a lot of time. So you spend time together. And if you travel, of course, you're going to travel together. But also there's talking. You must talk in, in, in your work setting. You must talk. And so there's always communication going. Even if you work, if you're working in a context uh, but behind a computer, you're able now to really engage in the talk and all that. So, so, so it's, it's a requirement. And then transparency before you know it. Just a casual lunch. Uh, just a casual conversation, just a casual moment uh, in the coffee, in the break room, just a casual moment, just kind of going to, to, to visit a client together could turn into you sharing something transparent or intimate about your children, about your health, about your spouse, about your finances, about your dreams and aspirations. So now we've, we've crossed to that threshold. And then also trust, because you trust them. And many times when people have marital issues, uh, they, they seek some sense of solace and support and counseling outside the marital union. Unfortunately, it oftentimes comes in the wrong package to the wrong person. So you're telling someone who has a listening ear to what you're saying, but they also may have a watching eye for who you are. And so you got to be careful with that. And then the last thing is touching. And once you get to the aspect of touching, when there starts the touching between you and someone that's not your spouse, you're way out of bounds. There should be no back rub. There should be no shoulder rubs. There should be no, well, let me just massage your temples in your head. There should be none of that. Let me massage your hair. Or if he's a boy, let me just, let me just rub your scalp. Any touching, because it breathes, it, 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 it excites the senses. And, and you know what I'm talking about. So these things that are meant to be properly explored and properly to be experienced in the context of marriage many times have not been used like they've, they've gone beyond that and if you're honest about today many of your spirits have become poisoned you become angry and bitter at God angry and bitter at people angry and bitter at relatives because you got caught in this quagmire you've been caught in this nest of someone who had a side piece and someone who was not faithful to you, although you were faithful to them. When you stood and said, I do until death do us part, you really meant that. When you said, forsaking all others, you really meant that. But whoever knew, whoever could have dreamt that they would not, and they did not mean that. Of course they did at the moment, but now it just looks like. So So, so what do we do? How do we, how do we address this? What steps can we take? What steps should you take? And we start back this journey of trying to say, now, how can we affair proof our marriage? I'm going to deal later on with the issue of rebounding from an affair. I deal with that in, in later weeks. But I want to talk about now how we can be able to affair proof. How can we avoid side pieces, be it a him or a her? What are some things that we really can do? Go get your pen. Go get your piece of paper. Put up real, real close and pay attention because you need to... Well, 
whether you've been married 20 minutes, 20 years, or 40 years, you need to know this. And so how can we do it? Well, the first thing I want to encourage your heart with is this. You must continue to walk closely with Jesus Christ. You must walk with Christ. You must have a walk with Christ in which you don't want to sin against God, in which you understand that he's the priority, he's the preeminent one over your life, and he is your life, and you want to please him. Many times we get raggedy in our human relationships because we've gotten raggedy in our spiritual relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so because raggedness has set in and now we're carnal, we're not careful. And so I'm saying that we got to make sure that, that our prayer life needs to continue to be an authentic prayer life. That our word life should, should not just be some repetitious devotion, but we should have times of worship, times of experience, times of crying before the Lord, laughing before the Lord, being excited before the Lord, but genuinely to walk with Him. Our first priority, according to John 15, is to abide in Him. Jesus said, abide in me and I abide in you, because apart from me you can do nothing. We must have an abide a continuous, a fruit-bearing relationship and with him, with him, with him, with him. So that's the first thing that you've got to do. So, so, so maintain the priority of just your walk with him. Not learning a lesson to teach. Not learning verses to preach. Not learning things because you've got, you've got a ministry, an auxiliary ministry, and you want to try to encourage some young men and some young boys. No, no, you're doing it simply because it's communion. You're in a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. These aren't just rituals. We have a relationship, a living, breathing human relationship. And one day we're going to see Christ face to face in which our faith shall become sight. So the first thing is continue your walk with Christ. Here's the second thing. Take authority over your thought life. you got to be able to take authority over your thought life. In this mind, in this body, we're saved. Yes, we are. However, there are still things that come inside of us from our old Adamic nature. Old thoughts, old patterns, old things that are still from the fleshly part of our lives. And there are things that pop into our mind. That's why the Bible talks about taking thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. You may not have any control of what comes into your mind, but you do have authority and control about how long it stays in your mind or what you do with what came into your mind. We must learn to really navigate through these waters that I talk about all the time related to faith. Fantasies. There's a fantasy in your mind. Have you ever noticed in your fantasy that he and she, he or she is always beautiful, always fit and trim, always smell good, always the best of the best? It's, it's, it's an illusion. It's a fantasy. It's not real. If David could have known what would happen after that one night stand, if he could have fast forwarded the tapes when he saw that bathing beauty named Bathsheba, he would have said, you know what? It's just not real. It's only an illusion. And I'm saying that you got to take thoughts captive. You got to understand what comes into your mind and what camp it came from. The camp that came into your mind to say, go and get with him, go and get with her. To, to look three times, four times, five times. To lustfully gaze upon him or her. That's not from kingdom camp. That's from the enemy camp. And you got to learn how to over and over and over again take those thoughts captive to the obedience of Jesus Christ. you got to learn to dump that junk and replace it. Replace it. The Bible says we must think on things, whatever is lovely, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is good repute. Think on these things. In fact, the Bible says in Philippians, let your mind dwell on these things. And so you got to let your mind begin to do, you got to retrain your mind, depending on how long you were in the world and what your sin of choice was in the world. If it was a fleshly sin, if you were, if you were one that was always involved in fornication and always involved in pornography and all those illicit things, then, then you got some things on your burner, on the burner of your mind. And God wants to change the hard drive of your mind through his word. You must learn to call scripture to bear when it said, there, there's no temptation that has overtaken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful who will allow you to be tempted above what you're able to stand. But with every temptation, he will bring the wherewithal, the resource, the empowerment in which you may be able to endure it. He wants to give you the power to come out of it. So you must learn to take the word of God. When you let it sit and soak, you're going to sin. 
You gotta learn to get that thought out of there. Uh, what, what, what if it comes back? It probably will come back, but you gotta do it again. Continue to retrain your mind. Don't let it live in your mind, but also you gotta enjoy your mate. You gotta enjoy your marriage bed. Hebrews talk, the 13 talks about that the marriage bed is undefiled. Uh, you gotta enjoy your marriage bed. You gotta enjoy your mate. I know you've been married for a while and, 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 and things may have moved around a little bit, but guess what? It's also moved around in you too. Or maybe you fit and trim. Maybe you work out all the time and maybe you, you know, you're just the best of the best. You, you, you are doing fitness shows or you're, you're a runner or you're a cyclist or you're a swimmer and you're just in the best shape. It does not matter. What matters is that your mate is more than just a body. They're more than just a receptacle uh, for you to have your thrills and your joy. It's a person inside of there. And so you got to enjoy them outside the bed as well as inside the bed. And so, so and that's why you got to avoid pornography because pornography introduced this idea of fantasy and illusion that no one can live up to. So you got to enjoy your marriage bed. Uh, try something new. Uh, come at it from a different approach. Uh, put some more music on. Bring in some more kind of flowers. Put in a new fragrance in the room. Go buy some new sheets. Buy a new bed spread. Go somewhere else. Go upstairs for a while and try downstairs for a while. Try the floor for a while. What, whatever. But just enjoy your mate outside the bed, also inside the bed. But enjoy. Caress her. Caress him. Touch and talk. But 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 talk about what you like and talk about what you don't like and and and, and talk about it and what you can protect. Put some parameters around your marital relationship. Don't. The Bible says first. And seven, that in fact, that the only time we should be abstinent in a marital context is that we're fasting. If we're fasting, seek the very will of God uh, by agreement. By agreement, it says. Why? The Bible says that Satan won't tip you for your lack of self control. In other words, that, that when we choose to act as if we're unmarried when we're married, when the marriage bed becomes stale, when it becomes dry, becomes repetitious, uh, then it opens the door for everything else. And it uses a telltale sign there's something else going on in the relationship that we must go check out and invest in and, and make sure that, in fact, that we're doing the little things. Uh, uh, to really improve our relationship. So be careful with that. Also, here's the fourth one. Be accountable. Here's the question. Who are you accountable to? Who are you accountable to? No, 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 no. No, I didn't ask you who your friend was. I didn't ask you who your girlfriend was. I didn't ask you who your shopping buddy is or who do you go to Starbucks with. I didn't ask you any of that. I asked you who are you accountable to. That, that, that must be someone or someone who's not impressed by your position, not intimidated by your accomplishments. And they can come and ask you, what are you doing? They can say, hey, I saw you go to lunch with so-and-so. What was that? I saw you on a long call. What was that? I saw you giggle at a joke that wasn't even funny because he or she said it. What was that about? And they can tell you, I see something. There's something there you must guard against. And you know you had that person to check you as to what's going on in your life. Who's your friend? The, the Bible says iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens the countenance of another. And so I'm saying you've got to be able to have somebody who will cause sparks in your life. Somebody come along and say, you know what? I see where you're going. And where you're going is, is not a good destination. It's going to erupt. It's going to destroy a whole lot of things. And you've got to be able to talk about it. There must be somebody who can talk you off the ledge. I don't care how fine she is, how, how, I don't care how, how fine you think he may be, I don't care how many, what, what kind of car they drive, I don't care if it's an import or an export, I, I don't care about the job, I don't care about the custom suits or the custom dress, I don't care if they have a private jet, I don't care if they're, if they're an entertainer or an athlete, I don't care, all I do care about is that you got to make sure that somebody can come get you and when you get in trouble. And they got access to you to say, I need to talk to you, not as your title, not as your accomplishment, not, not based on your net worth, but I need to talk to you based on being a man or a woman of God. And I need to let you know that there's something going on. And I love you too much to leave you. You got to stay right there and wrestle with them and say, I love you too much to leave you. Oh, wouldn't that be good? Somebody just crossed your mind right now that, that, that you need to go call right now and let them know I love you too much to leave you. Now, I know there's something going on and there's been going on and all these seeds of discord between you and your spouse it's going to lead to something but I love you too much to lead you. So what have I said? I said you got to stay close to the Lord.
Lord. I said, also, you got to pay, take authority over your thought life. I said, also, you got to enjoy your marriage bit. And also, you got to be accountable. But here's the last one. You got to believe that it can happen to you. Let me say that again. You must believe that it can happen to you. The Bible says that 1 Corinthians 10, 12, let him who's who thinks he stand, take heed lest he fall. The idea being is that you're sitting here and saying, well, I'll never do that. Others may do it, but not me. Oh, that pastor, you're wasting your time talking to me. No, 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 no. There's no sin that can't come and trip you up. There's no sin. And I'm saying that if you're in your hubris, if you're in your pride, if you're in your better than thou attitude, if you feel like there's no, oh, I'm telling you, it can happen to anyone unless you're on guard. So the first thing you ought to do is admit to the Lord, Lord, uh, this could happen to me. That's why in the prayer that Jesus teaches his disciples, he, he says, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so I'm saying that you ought to be praying, that, Lord, don't leave me in temptation. Lord, don't let me go. Don't let me listen to my own counsel. Don't allow me to think that I got, don't, don't let me think that, that I'm, I'm Superman or Superwoman and, 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 and my marriage is so concrete and, and, and I, I'm so godly, I'm so holy, uh, I'm so other than, uh, I'm the priest of my house and, and I'm, a, I'm a woman of God, I'm a first lady, second lady, third lady, I'm, well, whatever it may be. No, 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 you got to understand, the Bible says in, in Genesis that God says that the adversary, that sin is crouching at the door. And his desire is for you, but you must master it. He, he, he gives the idea that sin is like a prowling lion, like a prey. It's, it's like a panther that's waiting to pounce on you. It's crouching and it's waiting for the opportunity. I'm just simply saying you must know that it's there. I'm not saying you got to acquiesce to it and give yourself to it. Oh, you can't overcome it. Oh, yes, you can. But I want you to know that it can't happen there. Because I don't want you to be someone's side piece. I don't want you to make someone your side piece. We are children of God. And our marriages have a testimony. They're a billboard for a sovereign God. And God wants to use our marriage for his honor and his glory in the good times and in the bad times, in the joyful times and the sorrowful times. He wants to use all that for his honor and his glory because the constant is him. People wonder, how did you make it? You made it because of the grace of God. So I want you to know today, I want you to go and talk to your spouse. I want you to go and talk to your best friend. I want you to go to talk to your cubicle partner. I want you to pull somebody aside and say, watch this, or, or say, let's talk about this. We need to make sure that we are people, as the Bible says, be ye holy, for I am holy, says the Lord. That although the adversary ro roams around like a proud and lion, seeking someone, seeking someone to devour, it doesn't have to be you, it doesn't have to be me, it doesn't have to be us. We are children of the Most High God, and we've got power from on high. So I encourage your heart today. I want you to come back and visit. Come back next Friday. We're going to continue building this about how do we affair proof our marriages and how do we recover from the midst of an affair. How do you keep going when he or she decide to go with someone else? We're going to work it out. Tell your mama. Tell your daddy. Tell your auntie. Tell all your nymphs right here at Pastor B's kitchen table. We're breaking it up. We're breaking Breaking it down. We're chopping it up and we're building it back together again. And I want to see you right here next week. May God bless you. May God keep you. And oh, may God use you. See you next week. Mm -hmm.